there's something very odd missing at Walt Disney World, and that is mosquitoes. Yes, really. There are almost no mosquitoes at Walt Disney World, but that seems sort of surprising because it's Florida, it's hot, it's humid, and it's literally a swampland. So how did Disney achieve this? Well, it's actually pretty incredible, and that's our topic for today. My full-time job is a civil engineer, and so I love when I can put my civil engineering hat on and mix my two favorite topics, Disney and engineering. The reason that Walt Disney World has almost no mosquitoes is because of a massive civil engineering project led by someone named Joe Potter. And this project had a massive impact on Walt Disney World, but 99% of guests don't even notice it. If you have ever taken the ferry boat from the Transportation and Ticket Center to Magic Kingdom, you might have noticed that some of the ferry boats have names on them, and one of them says General Joe Potter. And that's because General Joe Potter had such a massive impact on Walt Disney World. Joe Potter was born in 1905 and was a West Point and MIT graduate. During World War II, he directed logistical planning for the invasion of Northern France. After the war, he served in Washington, D.C. as an assistant chief of engineers for civil work and special projects. Then, in 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed Joe to serve as the governor of the Panama Canal Zone. In that role, he was responsible for governing a community of over 40,000 people, as well as services including education, military, public health, medical care, fire, police protection, and the postal system. And this is also where he developed an extensive knowledge on how to get rid of swarms of mosquitoes that were really common in Panama. After serving with the U.S. Army for 38 years, Joe finally decided to retire in 1960. But soon after his retirement, he actually became the executive vice president of the New York World's Fair in 1964 and 1965. Everyone is counting the days until the opening of the great New York World's Fair, an exposition symbolized by the unisphere that dominates the grounds. While we may be counting the days, the workmen are counting the hours, for many buildings are yet to be completed. However, fair officials are confident that everything will be in readiness when the gates finally open to an expected 70 million visitors. We definitely need to deep dive on this soon. If you don't know much about the New York World's Fair, Walt Disney had four special projects there that really shaped a lot of iconic attractions at Disneyland and Disney World, including the People Mover, Small World, and several others. And the World's Fair is where Joe Potter met Walt Disney, and Walt Disney realized what an asset this man would be to the company, and so he hired him. Joe joined the company in 1965 as the Vice President of Florida Planning. And now my favorite thing, talking about how Walt Disney World was created. If you've been following along with our Vacation Kingdom series for the past couple of months, you basically know what was there, and that was almost nothing. There was a lake, that was Bay Lake, it had a small island in the middle of it, it had two cabins, and basically nothing else other than Swapland. And that meant that everything that we take for granted in the houses that most of us live in was not there. Things like utilities, they didn't have telephone lines, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have gas, there were no roads, they had to create these from scratch. They didn't have a septic system, they didn't have anything that we just use every day today. They had to build all of it. And to make it even more challenging, they had to build all of it on a giant Swampland. And there's so many fascinating things that came out of this project. Last week, we talked about the telephone company that actually had offices in the top of Cinderella Castle for a while. If you haven't seen that video, I'm going to link it here. There was all sorts of plans for futuristic transportation systems. We see some of them today, like the monorail, but there was also the old airport that was there for a couple of years. They had plans to design the city of Epcot in a really futuristic way in the radial style. But what was so important that Joe Potter did was actually building the drainage system, something that most people don't think of at all. It's a massive network network of waterway systems passing through Epcot, Animal Kingdom, Magic Kingdom, many of the resorts, and completely surrounding the property, and I bet that 99% of people have never even realized what it was. So now let's take a look at the history of the waterways at Disney. When they bought the land, it really just had Bay Lake, the Swampland, and some small streams that we will get to in a minute. And inside of that Swampland, which is basically just standing water, was an absolute ideal spot for mosquitoes to live and lay eggs. And so Disney needed to find a way to solve this. And the solution seems rather simple. They had to get rid of the breeding ground, AKA get rid of the standing water, AKA keep the water moving at all times. In the late 1960s, Disney moved 7 million cubic yards of dirt from the location of the Seven Seas Lagoon onto the future site of Magic Kingdom to create the nine acre subterranean service tunnels known as the Utilidors. And while they were doing that, they were actually excavating the rivers of America to build the Tom Sawyer's Island area and the waterways that would hold some iconic attractions like the Mike Fink Killboats, RIP, the Davy Crockett Canoes, RIP, and the Riverboat, soon to be RIP. And you might not realize, but Seven Seas Lagoon, the Rivers of America, and Bay Lake, they all share the same water source. 
And that water source is actually the Florida aquifer. We talked in how when they were building the Seven Seas Lagoon, they drained the entirety of Bay Lake to basically clean out all of it and make it a great place for people to swim. Well, they refilled it using the Florida aquifer. Pretty cool, and I always wondered where it came from. Now, according to a report from 1986, a summary of hydraulic conditions in the Reedy Creek Improvement District, the total area of Bay Lake, the lagoon, and the theme park watercourse is about 650 acres. This includes canals, levees, water control structures, and culverts that provide surface drainage. And to understand how Joe Potter so brilliantly got rid of mosquitoes, and also for me to talk about my favorite topic, yes, Disney Civil Engineering, we need to dive in a little bit more to that system. If you know a lot about Walt Disney World, or even if you've been around a couple of times, you've probably heard a couple of names, Reedy Creek and the Bonnet Creek. And I'll be honest, before researching this video, I never connected the fact that those are actually real creeks. I just thought they, they were names, which I don't know why I thought that. But the Reedy Creek, you probably know from the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which was in the news recently, but this is basically Disney's governing agency. And Bonnet Creek, you might know from the Bonnet Creek Resorts, and I believe there's also a Bonnet Creek Road. Well, those were also real creeks. There are also a couple of other creeks on property, not as important to this video, but I'll mention them anyway. The Cypress Creek, the Davenport Creek, and the Wittenhorse Creek. But our focus is going to be the Reedy Creek and the Bonnet Creek because those shaped this entire system that Joe Potter built. The Reedy Creek, which was a natural small little creek when Disney bought the property, ended up being altered significantly. They basically reworked it into massive drainage canals, which were later called Joe's Ditches after, obviously, Joe Potter, and added all sorts of gated control structures. So let's dive into the actual layout of what this is because it's incredibly expansive. The Reedy Creek drainage system has two twin canals that start just north of Magic Kingdom. They head west and make several sharp right turns, literally right angles, before heading directly south. From there, we'll follow the A Canal. This passes through the golf courses by the old golf resort, deep dive coming soon on this. It passes where they used to store Walt Disney's airplane, deep dive coming soon on this. And then it has several right turns. One of those turns connects back into the B Canal, south of Magic Kingdom. One of them cuts right through Animal Kingdom and the Safari, and you've probably seen it from Rafiki's Planet Watch, and one of them continues straight south. This part is very narrow. It's a little bit harder to see on a map, but it travels all the way down past the All-Star Resorts, past the ESPN Worldwide of Sports, past I-4, and then eventually connects with a massive Florida levee system called D-6. Now looking at the B Canal, this begins at Magic Kingdom as well. It follows that same southern route, making a series of hard right turns snaking through property. The B Canal also cuts all the way down to Animal Kingdom, and then it meets in with A Canal. And the canal system in total is over 100,000 linear feet long and is responsible for basically eliminating mosquitoes from the entire Magic Kingdom area. It's worth noting also that in addition to the Reedy Creek, which is this canal system that was reworked, there's also the Reedy Creek Basin, which conveys most of the surface drainage from the theme parks and the parking lots. Think there's a massive rainstorm in Magic Kingdom. There are some flooding issues sometimes, but where does that water go? It goes into this massive drainage system that Disney has. Now the other water system or the other kind of primary water system is the Bonnet Creek. The Bonnet Creek begins at the bottom right corner of Bay Lake. And I've actually seen it when I was at the campground, but I did not know what I was looking at. After passing by a small portion of the campground where you can actually walk alongside the Bonnet Creek, it then cuts south running between Epcot and Port Orleans Riverside slash Port Orleans French Quarter. From there, there is a branch that connects into the Sasagula River, which runs by Port Orleans, and also connects to the Village Lake, which is the lake at Disney Springs. The Bonnet Creek also continues south past Pop Century and ends up connecting into the same exact levee system, which is called D6, created in 1971 and completed by 1979. So you can see just how massive and complex this system actually is. Not only does it handle the drainage for all of the theme parks, all of the resorts, the boardwalk area, Disney Springs, and so much more, but it handles the drainage for the roadways. It also makes sure it maintains an appropriate water level to keep all of the habitats alive, because Disney has actually said they'll keep one third of their property dedicated to that natural Florida habitat, which is amazing. And because they created this massive water system that there is no standing water, no still water, there are functionally no mosquitoes in Walt Disney World. So if you're standing even at the campground, you won't find yourself being stung very often because Disney has done so much to eliminate them. Now, the water system is the really main part of this, but there are a couple of other things that they do that I want to talk about. Architecture, landscaping, and yes, pest control. So with the architecture, basically Disney did the same thing they do with the buildings. They made sure that none of the roofs of the buildings have any ponding that can happen. A really, really good example of this is Spaceship Earth. 
Spaceship Earth is a giant sphere, but it actually inside of one of those layers has its own drainage system, which is super, super cool. But they do this all over property. Epcot is a great spot to look at it. You can see it everywhere. There's never going to be any standing water on the roofs. And so we have the architecture, we have the drainage system, but there are two other things that Disney does really intentionally. And the first is their landscaping. I could do a full deep dive on Disney landscaping, and I think that I will because it's really cool how they use it thematically. But basically, they make sure that there's no standing water underneath the plants that they chose. Some plants are more susceptible to this than others, and that's a really easy way to make sure there's not mosquitoes kind of in those planted garden areas. They're also really careful with their bodies of water. They always have a fountain in there with water flowing, and they also have all sorts of types of fish in there to make sure there's no standing water. And the last thing that Disney does to get rid of the mosquitoes is they spray them, but they don't use the pesticide-filled sprays. Actually, it was Walt Disney, apparently, that did not want these anywhere on property. You can learn more about this and behind the scenes of the specific things they use to make sure the plants stay safe. But to keep mosquitoes away, they use something kind of common, garlic. Mosquitoes supposedly despise the smell of liquid garlic. And if you're wondering why can't you smell it? Well, they use a small enough trace that mosquitoes can smell it really strongly, but humans almost don't notice it. The next time you're in Disney, if you smell a little bit of garlic, know that it's actually a good thing keeping mosquitoes away. And that is all I have for you today. This is one of my favorite topics. I love mixing civil engineering and Disney, and I can't wait to talk more in the future. So be sure to hit the subscribe button and come back every Monday for Mouse Up's Monday as we deep dive into some of the coolest Disney topics. And I'll see you next time. Bye.